We're going to be talking about the, what's happening to the labor market, what's happening in, in the workplace, and I want to say that this is like the revenge of the nerds. Karen is someone that likes to talk about earnings elasticity, retention rates, productivity measurement. Productivity All measurement, there. you see, we're getting going. This is our time. <laughs> okay. But I think it does speak a little bit to what's happening in the labor market that we're opening with with this conversation about kind of what is happening in the labor market to the workforce at this unique and slightly confusing time. And delighted that we're going to have a conversation about that, Karen, because you've, you've looked at this, I think, more than, more than anybody I know. I, thank you, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to share the stage with you, Richard. Um, I, can, I can give a quick summary, sure. the one-minute version of what we're seeing. So at LinkedIn, we have these 900 million members worldwide, 200 million in North America. And it gives us a really good insight into the supply and demand side of the labor market. And of course, uh, what we're seeing right now is a rebalancing of the labor market. Employers who for a long time kind of were really desperately seeking talent are starting to become more choosy. And at the same time, we see job seekers starting to actually you know, show up a little bit more urgently in terms of their own job search. So things are rotating in the market. Um, but what I would say is it's still a very strong labor market. There are lots of pockets of opportunity. Yeah, lots and of vacancies. Lots of vacancies and still industries where employers are struggling to find the talent they want. So opportunities. How do you think about this, that what's happening almost psychologically? Because you read about the great resignation, the great reshuffle. There's also this sense that, as you just mentioned, that employees are becoming more discerning, more skeptical. I think of it as the great meh, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's sort of, yeah, maybe not. Like, how do you think about what's happening psychologically, especially yeah. post-pandemic? I love that question. I don't call it the great meh, but I, I know what you mean. Um, the way I think about it is really something changed with the pandemic. A lot of things changed with the pandemic. But one of the things in the labor market that changed was our desire, our appreciation, our insistence on flexibility so that's part of that whole remote hybrid discussion. I do think remote is here to stay in some part of our work experience. Um, and I also think that the other thing that changed was folks realizing that they had some agency over their career and this idea of embracing learning, embracing skilling, uh, feeling like they had agency to change, they weren't trapped. And I think a lot of that has to do, especially with Gen Z, we see a lot of Gen Z folks on our platform who are learning at a really rapid pace, who are embracing technological change that maybe we'll get into. Yeah, so. cool. yeah and what about, uh, you've, you've talked, and we've both in our different ways looked at this issue of gender and care and family. And it was a, it was a she session to start with, with this yeah. big hit, and then became a bit more of a he session, as you saw male labor supply not coming back. And how do you think about how men, women care, how it's all played out and is continuing to play out? Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question and then turn it back to okay, you, because sure. I want to hear your sure. take based on your book. Um, I would say we definitely had a, a kind of a she session at one point. We saw women really pull back from the labor market. We all know this um, because there weren't vaccines, kids weren't in school, there was a lot of extra elder care obligations, and that care burden was largely shouldered by women, and particularly women of the parenting age. So we saw that really clearly. We see it even now in terms of who wants to come back into the office, for example. Um, women, kind of, I would say, the millennial, younger Gen Z, the ones who have kids at home, they're the ones who are most looking for that flexibility still. But yeah. you know, how do I see that? Well, largely, I think women are starting to get back to that point where they're showing up at the same rates. The one thing that is lagging, though, is um, hiring of women for leadership positions. It, it, it kind of, frankly, after George Floyd and a move towards equality, we saw a big boost and it's starting to flag now. And so it's a little disappointing to see that women's rates of being hired into leadership positions is starting to slow down significantly. Do you think, do you think that's more on the supply side or the demand side? Is, is it more women, parents generally, just saying, maybe not men, but seeing the trade-offs differently post-pandemic? I think part of it is seeing that trade-off, that wanting to embrace flexibility. But I think the, it's a mistake to say, oh, women don't want these leadership roles. I think also we've taken our eye off the ball a little bit as we focus on this question of will we get a recession in America? And you know, my answer is I think we will, but I think it'll be extremely short and mild. I don't think it'll be catastrophic like prior recessions. Yeah. Um, but you know what, let me, I really want to like turn it to you, Richard, because if you don't already know, he wrote this amazing book um, of Boys and Men, 
And I want to hear a little bit about your take, because my take is a lot on gender differences, particularly with a lens through women. But men are important here, too, and are also having their own experiences. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so the, in terms of the labor market, the way I see this in particular is that we had this, like every recession since World War II, except the pandemic, hit men harder. Right? It was a he session. Uh, and that's because of these long-run trends, including automation, uh, outsourcing, et cetera. And, and, and what I've seen happen is this very weird thing happened in the pandemic. It was like an asteroid hit the economy and all kinds of weird stuff happened. And clearly women were hit hardest first. But now I'm seeing the resurgence of long-run problems, which is the falling labor force participation of men, especially when with lower levels of skill. So that speaks a lot to here, especially men of color, and so the long run issues of labor force participation of working class men didn't go away. And in some ways, post pandemic, I think we're sort of returning to that conversation. And I think that's part of a broader conversation that frankly we all need to have, which is about the fact that various groups of men and women are struggling in different ways at different points in the labor market. And, and I would say sometimes I'm a bit afraid that this debate is focused on the apex problem, mm -hmm. which is a problem. It's, it's, how, it's what's the diversity of our boardrooms and senior management. But everybody at the top is doing pretty well relative to where they were. But working class men, really struggling. And you see deaths of despair are mostly men, suicide rates rising, etc. So that's how I come at this. Well, you know, let's go a little bit deeper there. So why do you think it is that, I, I see it in the data too, by the way, if you, there's a certain, um, data series about um, men between the ages of, I think it's like 25 and 54 who are still living with their parents. Yeah. And it's elevated. There literally are still men living with their parents after the age of 25. And, yeah. and so why aren't men either able to, willing to access the opportunities? It's, what are the barriers and challenges that they're well, facing? I, I think that we have to recognize that the, the economic world has changed very significantly technologically in terms of the labor market international labor market, but also just in terms of the economic relationship between men and women in a way that's terrific. I mean, I just, I think that whilst there's still much more to be done, of course, we have nonetheless in the last few decades seen a real calibration of the relative economic power and role of men and women. And I think that there are a lot of men who are struggling to find a sense of purpose and footing in the labor market and, more, and in society more generally. And that's dangerous. That's bad for our families. It's bad for women. Look, I. I I really worry that in this debate we're not allowed to think two thoughts at once, but if we can pay ourselves the courtesy of thinking we can think two thoughts at once, then we can think. There's a bunch of men, especially men of color and working class men, who are really struggling in the labor market. I mean, just look at what's happened to, to the wages of black men in the last 20, 30 years, by contrast to, say, white women. And again, it's not to say the job done, but white women now earn much more than black men. And that was not true even 40 years ago. So it's back to this intersectionality point more generally. But I actually want to push you a bit on the technology point, because you work for a tech company, right? So it's, all, it's ultimately all, all your fault. Um, uh, Love that. Let's, let's, get, let's dive in. Okay. It's unfortunate. LinkedIn is about the only company you can't blame for almost every evil in society. So it's unfortunate. Um, but so you're looking at this through this kind of lens. So it, let's, I think automation pretty clearly did hit male jobs more. AI, though, I think it's not clear yet how that's going to impact. And isn't, I, I actually think AI might hit traditionally women's jobs more than men's jobs. AI, you know, AI is this, it's real, it's here. It's going to take a long time to realize all the changes. So we're all kind of. I guess projecting forward what we think might happen, and I am definitely doing that at this stage, but it's true, it's, this technological change will be different than prior ones. It may not hit the same segment of the labor market. It may fall more heavily on um, jobs that um, have a multitude of tasks that can be routinized. And I think right now, even, oops, sorry, even now at LinkedIn, we look at all of the jobs and occupations as bundles of tasks and skills that are needed to perform those tasks. And our question is, which tasks are likely to be most exposed to AI? Which ones are likely to be routinized enough that you don't have to spend time on them? So without directly answering your question, what I would say is it's an enormous amount of change. We're seeing on our platform already a lot of people who are 
feeling that trepidation of like, how do I prepare myself for what I know is coming? And they're either choosing to dive into learning courses that we've made available um, you know, for free. Um, uh, over, I think, over 100 courses around AI are available. But we also see people adding skills at this rapid rate. And so I think there's a sense of like, how do I prepare myself for this enormous change, which I can't quite dimension. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I will close by just saying, with regard to who's going to be most exposed, I think the jury's out. But definitely, it's not going to be just the most manual of tasks. It will be a middle tier of roles yeah. that have a high degree of exposure. And the question is not like, oh, AI is going to start doing my job. The question is, can I ramp myself up so that I can be a user of AI so it complements me, it takes, strips me out of some of the aspects of tasks that I don't really need to spend as much time on so that I can spend more time on the things that really matter. And a great example uh, we were talking about at LinkedIn, because we think a lot about recruiting, was how recruiters might spend less time with AI, might spend less time going through all of the uh, job applications, but have AI even cast a broader net so that they can kind of pull people who may not even have a prior uh, job title or might not have a degree that you normally are looking for as a filter. You, can, you don't have to use these filters anymore. You can just scan for skills and experiences you're looking for. So AI might allow us to cast a broader net faster and let us do more interesting work. The negotiation, the getting to know people, that part of the discussion right. is more of a yeah. higher level human skill that we can rely on. Yeah, I think, it, I think what's lost sometimes is the sense that the change will be within jobs rather than between jobs. There is this kind of theological concept right. that sin runs within people, not between people. And I think AI is going to be a bit like that with jobs as well. Uh, and I also think right now it's a raw starch test for everything you think about society. If you think society is becoming more unequal, it's, this is going to make it worse. If you think that w whatever you think about the world, you can project that onto, onto AI. But one thing I think I do want to talk a bit more about, because we're both interested in inequality, and I'm particularly interested in mobility, and I know you've done work on that as well, and the way in which you see the current state of inequality in the labor market. Obviously, equity is a big a big theme for, for JFF, and you've just seen the, the, the North Star. And again, the danger is that some of these trends, like the ability to know how to use prompts, access AI, reskill, etc., are going to be good for people like us, maybe good for the people that predominantly use your platform, but maybe not so good for those who don't have those starting skills. So how do you see the skill-driven dimension of inequality playing out in this new labor market. Yeah, and I think that's why we're here, right? We want to see how do we go through a transition without leaving a horrible wake of people left behind who feel disempowered, disengaged, and don't have the same access to opportunity. And I think one, I'll give one answer. There's probably a you probably have all the answers, right, not me, but one answer that we're thinking a lot about at LinkedIn is this idea of how can we approach skills-based hiring where we give this sense of like, I don't want to hire just for someone who had that job title, who held a degree that I've decided is required, but rather how do I filter across a multitude of candidates just based on the skills that they may have, no matter what job they did. And what I would say here is when we look at the counterfactual. What would happen if I search just by degree or job title? I'll get X number of people. But if I say, don't worry about that, just look for skills, what I find in the US is I can expand the talent pool uh, 19 times, right? Okay, it doesn't mean that all 19 times of those people now included are getting hired, but I've now cast a wider net again. And what we also find, coming back to the gender issue, is that often it disproportionately benefits people of color, women, other underrepresented groups who haven't had that job title, haven't had that network access to get them the job they yeah. needed. Yeah. So I think skills-based hiring is I think that. I also think network-based hiring as well. I think we're going to get to a kind of network-first thing. So I think there's skills, there's culture, there's retention. There's also the prospect of upward mobility. So coming back to this, the North Star, I just want to give a quick, I'll give a 20-second JFF commercial here. I'm on the board of JFF. 40 seconds. Uh, this is important. Counting. We have a, <laughs> but I have to say, just to have that kind of North Star 
uh, so focused on, on equity and also just the transformation of JFF. So I'm just going to take indulge for a moment. I've been on the board of JFF five or six years now. When I joined, I was reluctant to join because JFF at the time was, I saw JFF as a bit like one of my favorite uncles, you know, a bit dull, quite nice, mostly harmless. <laughs> apologies, in the front row, apologies so to everybody. Was, but you know what I mean? That was kind of, but I got to tell you, under Maria's leadership, and I hope most people in this room will agree, it's why you're here. Under Maria's leadership, this has become a kick-ass organization, right? I mean, like, let's, look at this, right? All right, what a, like a real force. It's like my uncle got up and lost 50 years and start, took up boxing again. Or I don't know, I don't know, whatever the, whatever the, the, the analogy is. But, but this, the North Star is also about upward mobility. It's also about, and I feel passionately about this, internal labor markets allowing people to move on and up. And I think I've heard you say that companies that offer that upward mobility also retain more, get more out of there. So say a bit more about why that's true and what folks in the audience could do with that knowledge. Yeah, so the idea is um, we took a look at just every, you know, as we had this moment, which we called the great reshuffle, this moment where employers were struggling to hire, um, we said, well, you know, you also have great talent already sitting there, maybe higher from within, and you already know who is strong and has potential. And so we thought about how do you retain the best of the best in your company if you're, you know, a corporation, a nonprofit. And what we found is that when you offer internal mobility options, if you excel at that for your workforce, you retain them twice as long. They stay twice as long because and it's, it's normal, right? You ask them, why did you stay you know, 20 years at such and such place? Well, I just never, you know, everything kept changing. It was always a great opportunity. So this internal mobility is extremely powerful for also upskilling within an organization. And it's, it's good for the company. It's good for the worker. All right. So if that's, if that's one of your messages to institutions, there's a lot of institutions in this room. Internal what, mobility? Yeah. So what, what, what would be other two big takeaways that you would want to give to Right. Uh, so internal mobility, skills first approach to hiring so you can expand that talent pool, um, grab out those people that maybe you've missed in the prior filters. And then maybe last but not least, remembering that flexibility is something we've all fallen in love with. Nobody likes their commute anymore. And so the ability to offer people flexibility in whatever dimension that means for your organization is highly valuable and prized. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And you've done a lot of work on, the, on care infrastructure, right, and how companies need to think about there's this sort of decade where we just basically clobber parents, yes. especially mothers, by saying this is the most important decade for your career development, which by some evil genius we've managed to make the same decade when your kids are most right. needed, right? So you basically, and this is again maybe a higher class problem, but for most women who want to advance, you, you, you have to, what we found is you really need to sprint in the first 10 years of your career in order to get to the same level as men t you know, 20 years out. Men have the whole 20 years to run that sort of like casual race and women need to do a sprint to get there because they've got child and yeah. elder care issues. Yeah, I, I agree with that and I sometimes fear, you know, we're always promised, when we have, as long as I've been in the labor market, we're promised this idea of family friendly work. But all too often what we end up giving families is, is work friendly families. We actually ask families to redesign their lives and their schedules around the needs of the employer. And I, I think I, I sense part of the, what I call the, the great meh is a resistance to that. And so the, the idea that the institution of the family is separate from the institution of the labor market has been insane for decades. But I really sense that the insanity of that <laughs> is really kind of landing with people now, right? It's just like, like this is the world we're all actually living in and trying to raise our kids in now. And if employers don't get that, then I don't think a lot of the equity goals that we're going to have um, will be achievable. And so I think you're right, skills first, sure, retention, but also let's have genuinely family-friendly work, not the other way around. Right. And that will be good for men, women, children, society. Everybody, right? Perfectly said. All right. Well, thank you. We're, we're out of time. But thank you so much, Karen. What? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Yay. Amazing.